Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast, Episode 17, To the Strongest, The Fourth War of the Diodohoi. Ever since Antigonus and Demetrius were busy settling their quarrel with Seleucus in the years 310 to 308 BC, the other successors had either been recuperating or attempting to undermine the Antigonid realm. As I stated before, the peace of the dynasts in 311 was no more than the mere truce, a maintenance of the status quo. The territories remained virtually the same, minus the lost Asian provinces that Seleucus would gobble up in the aftermath of the Babylonian War. The other marshals fully expected an eventual renewal of the conflict, and they did their best to either shore up their own defenses or take the offensive approach and directly challenge the Antigonids while they were away in Babylon. In the case of Macedon, the Third Diodohoi War really shook Cassander's position, just narrowly avoiding a full-scale invasion by Antigonus a few years prior. To make matters worse, Polyperkin, the nominal regent of Macedon, who was ousted into obscurity by the efforts of Cassander a number of years prior, came forward at the head of an army, along with a young man named Heracles, allegedly a bastard son of Alexander the Great. The sources are mixed on whether the claim was true or not, but needless to say, another Archiad to heir to the throne was not something that Cassander needed. I spoke towards the end of the last episode that he had also grown tired of babysitting the young Alexander IV and his mother Roxanne, and decided that there was an easier way to deal with all of this. First, he ordered the execution of Alexander and Roxanne, and then proceeded to offer to cut Polyperkin in on a deal. B offered General of Greece, a nominal position, mind you, but still, he would receive all the benefits of such a position. In return, kill Heracles. The last gasp of the Argeid house as it was snuffed out would color Cassander's reputation throughout the decades and centuries following, tainting his memory as the butcher of Alexander the Great's family, and the subjects of Macedon would not forget this act. For the time being, though, The throne of Macedon felt just a little bit more comfortable. In a surprising instance of flipping character traits, the normally aggressive Cassander was on the defensive, while the more reserved Ptolemy had done his best to harass the Antigonids. In early 310 to 309, he had sent forth raiding parties into Cilicia, and while these attempts failed, he managed to successfully recapture the island of Cyprus to secure control of the waters of the Aegean. The next movements Ptolemy would make suggest that the near-isolationist was also not immune to the alluring effects of imperial ambition. A marriage proposal was sent to Cleopatra, that half-sister of Alexander and sometime bargaining chip, to arrange a union between Ptolemy and the Argeid house, or what was left of it. He had also pushed for an alliance between himself and Ptolemaeus, a general under Cassander, and actively fomented dissent in the cities of Greece to not fall under the sway of the promises of Antigonus, nor Cassander, nor Lysimachus. And we assume he may have also been trying to reunite the League of Corinth under his own banner. Perhaps the dream of retaking Macedon had rekindled the hungry drive of Ptolemy. But this would be short-lived, considering Antigonus would have poor Cleopatra assassinated, and the envoys of Ptolemy were met with a less-than-warm response. Cassander was able to set aside his grievances with Ptolemy for the time being, especially now that the war between Seleucus and the Antigonids was over. Antigonus and Demetrius could now turn their full attention towards the other Diadohoi. In 308, the Fourth War of the Diadohoi would begin. Both father and son realized that taking on each of the Hydra's heads individually was not the stratagem to follow. Instead, Antigonus planned a great invasion of mainland Greece by sea. The region was dominated by Cassander and Ptolemy, yes, but at the center of Greek support was Athens, and inside was a rather sizable group of pro-Antigonid Greeks. So, in 307, Antigonus entrusted the naval expedition to Demetrius, granting him 250 ships and about 5,000 talents of silver, hoping that winning the hearts and minds of the Athenians would be the great linchpin in all of his future endeavors. The landing was a huge success, to say the least. Though initially hostile to the ships docked outside of the Athenian harbor, the gathered citizens quickly lay down their arms in jubilation upon sight of Demetrius, and upon the message that his herald bore. 
Demetrius had come to set Athens free, expel the garrison of Cassander, and restore the Athenians to democracy once again. The Antigonids had been pushing propaganda, marking themselves as the saviors of Greece since at least 315 BC, and they had cultivated strong ties with several city-states for many years, with Demetrius even marrying a wife from Athens, and it all had finally paid off. The Athenians showered both father and son with honors, creating voting tribes named after each of them, ordering the craft of two gilded statues, and, most importantly, they hailed them as kings and virtual demigods with the institution of a divine cult in their honor. Now, Antigonus and Demetrius politely refused this title, but there was a huge moment in a post this was but this was a huge moment in a post Argiad world. The opinions of Greeks on ruling was not as important, but it would set a precedent in the immediate future for the rest of the successors. They would not need to keep the facade up for much longer. Unfortunately for Demetrius, his father ordered him to cast all notions of a glorious land invasion inside for the moment. Ptolemy was still out there, mastering the waters of the Mediterranean. The stronghold of Ptolemy lay on the island of Cyprus, and from there he could easily launch fleets to raid the coastline from Asia Minor down to the Levant in Syria. Disappointed, Demetrius took his leave, but he would once again have the chance to demonstrate his prowess for battle and glory. In the city of Salamis in Cyprus, a brother named Ptolemy named Menelaus was in commanding of a force of roughly 12,000 infantry and 800 cavalry to meet the Antigonids, who had landed not too far north of the city. Demetrius commanded roughly 15,000 soldiers himself, and when they had met, he had steamrolled over the Ptolemaic general, sending him fleeing as the Antigonid ships began to tighten the noose around the island with a blockade to forestall any attacking navies or starve out defenders inside. Salamis was placed under siege, and it was on this occasion that the technology of the Hellenistic period begins to shine. I've referred to Demetrius in the past as Demetrius Polyarchites. Polyarchites means, roughly, the taker or besieger of cities. Though the name itself had a hint of irony, given that he wasn't always the most successful, but that doesn't really matter, because boy, he could put on a show. Alexander certainly had some of the finest engineers and siege weapons makers of the ancient world, but Demetrius would take that and crank it up to 11. Along the shoreline, he would craft one of his famed city takers, a Halepolis, a wooden structure that was 135 feet tall and 68 feet wide, and that wouldn't even be the biggest one he would build, as we soon shall see. There were multiple catapults stationed inside of it, several giant ballistae which acted like supersized crossbows, along with battering rams and protection for the men to avoid the arrows and stones that were launched by the defenders. For some sort of visual reference, imagine the siege towers from the Siege of Gondor in Lord of the Rings, but add all that extra stuff on there for maximum city destruction. Though it would devastate the walls and defenders of Salamis, Menelaus would manage to find a simple solution to counteract the behemoth, he gathered a large amount of dry wood, placing it along the base of a tower in the cover of night. Then he ordered flaming arrows to be used to set the whole structure ablaze, much to the chagrin of Demetrius. Now, Demetrius couldn't gripe about his broken toys for long, though. In the horizon lay a vast gathering of ships, captained by none other than Ptolemy himself. Word had reached him from Menelaus of the terrible danger they were all in, and so the Lord of Egypt had collected 200 warships and hundreds of transport vessels to strike at the Antigonid fleet, which numbered only 160 at best. In a brilliant, if ambitious move, Demetrius only placed 10 quinqueriums at the mouth of the harbor, lest Menelaus decide to ambush from behind, and he had much of his cavalry deployed along the shore to capture any troops that may have fallen overboard. The two lines of warships began to close in on one another. Both were gambling their strategy on being able to crush their opposing right wing and push through the center. On this day, it would be Demetrius who would prevail, scattering Ptolemy's surviving ships, and he managed to capture at least half of the manpower Ptolemy had assembled, many of whom had not been able to even leave their transport vessels. With no other option in sight, Menelaus surrendered the city. The long-held Ptolemaic port was now in Antigonid hands, where it would remain for the next ten years, and Ptolemy was left licking his wounds given the huge loss in manpower and sea power. Now, Demetrius never forgot his debts, and he returned much of the personal friends and retinue of Ptolemy who were captured in one of the vessels that were taken by the Antigonid forces, 
As repayment for the latter's generous treatment of the former at the, after the Battle of Gaza a number of years prior. This victory at Salamis was not only important strategically, but also culturally. Having felt confident in their own abilities and position, both Antigonus and Demetrius were to take up the royal diadem and proclaim themselves Basileia, kings of Macedon. Now, it really was only a matter of time before the Diadochoi would cease the pretension of being kings in their own right, especially with Alexander IV being dead for well over three years by now. The throne of Macedon was vacant. But nobody wanted to take the political heat of being the first to try and claim the actual title of king. The title wasn't a mere propaganda piece. It was an attempt to legitimize their individual authorities over their dominions. And with Antigonus now the most powerful man in the region, he could now safely make his claim. The other marshals of the empire, Lysimachus, Seleucus, Ptolemy, and Cassander, would all eventually take the title of Basileus in 305 and 304. But this didn't really seem to bother Demetrius one bit, and while in a drinking party, he is said to have proposed, quote, Seleucus as the master of elephants, Ptolemy as admiral, Lysimachus as treasurer, end quote. It is telling to see the level of respect Demetrius had for Seleucus and Ptolemy, but didn't even think to mention Cassander. And Lysimachus was also super angry at the jest, considering that it was apparently royal custom to make the treasurer a eunuch. The next stage of Antigonus's plan was to enter into the lair of Ptolemy himself, Egypt. Antigonus amassed a massive invasion force of numbering around 90,000 soldiers across 250 sea vessels and landed in October of 306, unusually late in the year to do so. But he had little time to spare if he wanted to prevent Ptolemy from recovering after the disaster at Salamis. Antigonus would take his land route along the coast, where the fleet would be captained by Demetrius, who was looking for a way to follow and supply his father through the opening of the mouth of the Nile Delta. Well, this didn't really turn out. Numerous delays and fierce windstorms kept most of Demetrius' fleets from disembarking, and this included the loss of a few ships and dozens of men. Nothing to show for his efforts except for a few missing ships and a loss of some crew, Demetrius returned back to his father, while Ptolemy was able to shore up his defenses across the Nile River. Perhaps the memory of Perdiccas's many disasters in attempting to cross the Nile some 15 years prior in the First War of the Diadochoi was still fresh in Antigonus's mind, so he decided to not risk it, and ordered a retreat back to Palestine. With this failure, lying mostly on Demetrius' inability to secure a landing site, Antigonus lost quite a bit of momentum in his efforts. Looking to recover any sort of lost prestige, Antigonus tried his best to use his son's skills somewhere else, at another of Ptolemy's sea-based strongholds. The island of Rhodes, located off the coast of Anatolia, had been trying to keep out of the affairs of the Diodolhoi as best as it could. Upon the death of Alexander the Great in 323, the city had overthrown its Macedonian garrison and declared itself independent. Its strategic importance was well attested by the pro perdican attempts to recapture it in the first Diadohoi War, but the Rhodians were master seafarers and managed to fend off naval attack after naval attack. Nominally, they were neutral, but had stronger ties to Ptolemy for economic reasons, specifically serving as the middlemen between Egyptian grain exports and the Greek world. And though they were coerced into the third Diadohoi War to build Antigonus a fleet of ships, the city could become a valuable asset to further secure the gains the Antigonid forces had over the Mediterranean with the capture of Cyprus, and to recover their prestige after the disastrous invasion in Egypt. If they could get together another valuable naval port, expand their own coffers given Rhodes prodigious wealth, and strangle the Egyptian income at all the same time, well, all the better. Demetrius was given much of the same task as his job at Salamis. Given his propensity for siege warfare, it seemed like a natural fit since Rhodes was incredibly well fortified despite its small population. So, in the year 305, the fleet of Demetrius had arrived on the coast of the island. The Rhodians inside were initially cowed into signing an alliance with the Antigonids, but remembering their loyalty to Ptolemy, they reneged on the agreement, believing that Demetrius would overthrow the governing body, and instead settled in for what was going to come. 
Demetrius the Besieger, as he was now known, had certainly had his appetite for outlandishly large sea craft wedded at Salamis, despite its destruction. He had built one of the largest siege devices ever created, a helepolis that numbered 140 feet high, increasing the size of the previous one by 50%. I've included a large detailed diagram in the show notes for this episode on my website. It really was a marvel of engineering, and I can only imagine the horror of the Rhodian forces when they saw just how gargantuan it actually was. I also imagine that Demetrius was thoroughly pleased at the effect, and probably assumed that the siege would be over in, uh, what, a matter of weeks? Well, it wouldn't just be a few weeks. It would last an entire year. The sight of the siege tower ironically bolstered the resistance to the Antiquan forces, since the Rhodians believed that Demetrius wouldn't go through all this enormous cost and effort just to scare them. He was probably going to destroy the walls in the city completely. What's that old axiom? It's not the size of your siege weapon, it's how you use it? Well, the Rhodians managed to overcome the Helepolis by either threatening to burn it down to the ground after prying some of the metal sheets covering it, Or, according to the Roman engineering wizard Vitruvius, a Rhodian engineer named Diogenetus managed to construct a makeshift levee to allow water to flood the land nearest to the wall. The Helepolis' enormous weight of 140 tons eventually caused its wheels to sink into the muck, and the Antigonids had to abandon it. The rest of the siege was a bit of a disaster for Demetrius. The Rhodians were able to be supplied by the efforts of Cassander, Lysimachus, and most of all Ptolemy. Eventually, the siege had to be abandoned, but a deal was be able to be cut between the two. Demetrius and Antigonus would recognize as Rhodes independence and autonomy, but the Rhodians would agree to aid the Antigonids as best as they could. The catch was that they were unwilling to do any harm to the Ptolemaic cause. Papers were signed, and Demetrius left, horribly embarrassed. The Rhodians, in jubilant celebration, hailed the other Diodohoi as heroes, giving Lysimachus and Cassander gilded statues. But to Ptolemy, they dedicated a cult to him, giving him the title Soter, or Savior, for his years of loyalty to them. They also scrapped the bronze from the Helepolis, and used to construct one of the great wonders of the ancient world, the Colossus of Rhodes, standing over 100 feet tall in the image of Helios, the sun god. Now, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Audible. Well, it's that time of year again, where I become sick to death of shoveling snow and dealing with the bitter cold, or just being stuck inside. Now, to help remedy this, I like to listen to Audible to pass the time. Audible makes it easy to access an unparalleled selection of audiobooks, original shows, and more right at your fingertips. As a special offer for listeners of the show, Audible is currently offering a 30-day free trial membership, along with a free credit to the book of your choice, to keep. That's right, free. This episode, I'm going to recommend 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed, by Eric Klein. A fascinating analysis, ranging from the environmental to the economical, of the tumultuous end of the Late Bronze Age, with left the Mycenaean Greeks of Homer and most of the kingdoms of the Near East in ruins. To get this book for free and find out more, go to audibletrial.com forward slash Hellenistic Age Podcast. That's audibletrial.com forward slash Hellenistic Age Podcast, and get started today. While all of this was going on, the situation in Greece was rapidly turning for the worse in the Antigonid cause. Cassander had been benefiting from the absence of the father and son, using the opportunity to capture Salamis in Attica, breaking up the Aetolian League's loyalty to the Antigonids, and even put Athens under siege in 304. Demetrius was sent from Rhodes to retake the lost territories of central Greece. However, this was a bit rocky to say the least. Demetrius embroiled himself into a political controversy in Athens, to the point where he forced the issue by openly backing one of the two political groups to end the debate. Not a good image to project when you're championing the freedom of the Greeks and playing favorite with the deems. Plutarch also discusses in detail the more peculiar vices of Demetrius and his characteristics. Though personally valiant, and he had a generous streak to him, he was a very passionate man and prone to drinking parties. 
Not a particularly un-Macedonian-like quality, but it was to the point where Antigonus smartly remarked to Demetrius asking when the camp was to be broken with, quote, Why are you afraid that you'll be the only man who doesn't hear the trumpet? Demetrius was also extremely amorous, to put it politely, with several mistresses and lovers, but he seemed to have the taste in more mature women. He was hopelessly in love with a woman named Lamia, who was many years his senior, which had become the butt of a joke around the barracks and camps, where some Antigonid envoys were sent to Lysimachus, and in response to Lysimachus's boasting of scars from a famous lion hunt, the Antigonid envoys replied that Demetrius had scars too, from a Lamia, the double entendre in reference to the half-human, half-snake monster of legend. It also seems that the title of Basileus in Divine Cults went to his head, with the eager adoption of rather gaudy clothing dyed the rich Tyrian purple and embroidered with gold, even taking up a stupid-looking cap later in his career. Alexander the Great was certainly no slouch when it came to pure, unfiltered arrogance. But, as Plutarch drives home, when you compare Demetrius to a man like Pyrrhus in relation to Alexander, the resemblance is superficial at best. Quote, and many men declared that Pyrrhus was the only king in whom they could see an image of the great Alexander's courage. The others, and especially Demetrius, only imitated Alexander in the pomp and outward show of majesty, like actors on a stage. End quote. These little distractions and sideshows didn't manage to delay the whirlwind campaign that Demetrius would embark along the Peloponnese afterwards. He managed to capture the city of Sicyon, what was apparently so generous in his treatment of the citizens inside that he managed to receive yet another divine cult in his honor. At this point, they're just handing out divine status like it was candy. Anyways, his mission in Greece was a success. Political mastery of the region was reinforced in the spring of 3 and 302 by the reformation of the League of Corinth, that Macedonian-led organization made of Greek city-states originally conceived by Philip II almost 50 years prior and with it he saw to check Cassander's power, for good. Speaking of Cassander, what was he up to? Well, mostly shaking in his boots, or sandals, or whatever. And tips a negotiation between both him and the Antigonids for peace would end up in either nothing at all, or the demand for complete and utter supplication. Currently, it was just him and Lysimachus trying to protect themselves as best as they could. They both came to the conclusion that victory was not possible if they worked alone. So, recalling the past successes of the alliances with Ptolemy, which was easily rearranged since Ptolemy was really ironing that piece of Syria the Antigone had laid claim to, the other wild card was the return of Seleucus Nicator. Seleucus had spent the last six years carving out an empire in the eastern provinces of Alexander's former domain eventually culminating in a war with the powerful Sandracotus, better known as Chandragupta Maurya, who had recently come into possession of a vast empire spanning throughout the Indian subcontinent. The Mauryan Empire is a fascinating subject, one we will be exploring in depth in the future. But for now, all we will need to know is that the part of the settlement between Chandragupta and Seleucus was an exchange of 500 Indian war elephants, the most well-trained and bred variety available and it would come to be one of the decisive factors in the coming conflict. So, after arranging this alliance, it was Cassander and Lysimachus' turn to go on the offensive. 29,000 troops were sent by Cassander with Aunt Lysimachus to engage in a mass invasion of Asia Minor, while he himself would deploy a considerable force into Thessaly in northern Greece. Demetrius was caught off guard, apparently busy initiating himself in some mystery cult at the time, and fighting between him and Cassander really didn't amount to anything. Mostly, it was dependent on the action going on in Asia Minor, where Lysimachus and his supporting generals were having great success. Enough to rouse out of retirement Antigonus, who was enjoying his old age founding the city of Antigonea. With support in Greece and Asia Minor now crumbling, and word of Ptolemy's invasion of Phoenicia and Seleucus' involvement, Antigonus came to the conclusion that it was now the end game. There was no choice but to recall Demetrius back to help him because he would need all the forces he could muster to engage in one last all-or-nothing battle to finally snuff out the other successors. Alea Iocta Est. The die is cast.
In 301 BC, the great climax of the Fourth Diodohoi War would take place in the southern part of Anatolia, in Phrygia, near a little town known as Ipsus. The ones involved knew this would be a watershed moment. Antigonus, normally boisterous in rallying his troops with a display of personal bravado, was unusually demure the morning of the battle. Antigonus was 81 years of age. Though now king, he possibly was self-aware of the fact he was no longer the youthful and valiant commander in the army of Philip II or Alexander. He had grown rather fat and out of shape, despite keeping a sharp mind about him, but he was tired. Tired of the warfare that he was engulfed in for over 60 years that took him across the entire known world. He is said to have even had the misfortune of tripping out of his tent while preparing for battle, a grave omen to the Greeks and Macedonians and he even asked for a painless death, if victory was not to be his. He beckoned his son to him, proclaiming to the army that Demetrius was his direct heir, and then spoke nothing further, beckoning Demetrius to his tent for a private moment. We are unsure of what was said, but I wouldn't be surprised if both the father and son had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Antigonus and Demetrius were always said to be very close, even if Antigonus had never particularly approved of his son's amorous relationships, nor his fondness for drinking. Plutarch himself makes point to note that this was an unusual relationship, but in a good way. Of the dynasties of Macedon and the other Hellenistic kingdoms to come, where parricide and fratricide were common features in the games of power, but the love and trust between Antigonus and Demetrius stood out amongst them all. The Antigonid forces were as follows. 70,000 infantry, 10,000 cavalry, and 75 war elephants. The armies of Cassander, Lysimachus, and Seleucus numbered around 64,000 infantry, 10,500 cavalry. And thanks to the aid of Seleucus, 400 additional Indian war elephants and 120 war chariots. The stakes were high. Cassander himself had about half of his entire force at Ipsus. And if the Antigonids won, his kingdom was naked to invasion and there would be no way to stop them. Ptolemy is inconspicuously missing from the battle, though he'd probably say he was offering his moral support to the anti-Antigonid coalition. It must be mentioned that serving on the Antigonid side was a young officer from the Molossian region of Epirus. His name was Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus was a prince in exile from the royal house of Epirus, and had sought refuge from an insurrection initiated by the efforts of Cassander. Conveniently, Demetrius was married to a sister of Pyrrhus named Didyma, who was a relative of Olympias. This marriage was arranged to secure the support of Pyrrhus, where Pyrrhus was king at the time, but was once again ousted from his homeland by Cassander. Though we know little about his role in the upcoming battle, he is said to have fought valiantly. But in time, this young man would move from an exiled office to one of the greatest generals of the ancient world. We will be covering his rise to power in an upcoming episode, so let us turn back to the battle. The opposing armies lined up against one another. The heavy cavalry of Demetrius, taking his position as Alexander did 25 years before him, was stationed on the right wing. While Antigonus would take his place among the phalanxes, with his elephants placed in front to screen any incoming cavalry of other elephants. Unfortunately, the battle itself is not as detailed as the other ones we have seen so far, given that the main source of the period, Diodorus of Sicily, appears only in fragments and epitomes from 302 onwards. What can be summed from the help of Plutarch is that Demetrius pursued a victory by using his cavalry to strike a decisive blow. He had led a charge against a contingent commanded by Antiochus, son of Seleucus, who was then driven off the battlefield. It is unknown if Demetrius was caught up in the glory of the moment and desperately wanted to chase after the beaten Antiochus, or Antiochus was deliberately trying to lure the Antigonid cavalry away from the rest of his army. When Demetrius was pulled far enough from behind the lines of the enemy, Seleucus deployed a screen of elephants behind him to, to prevent Demetrius from returning. The main body of the Antigonid infantry was taking an enormous beating. Antigonus's elephants were swarmed by Seleucus and Lysimachus's elephants, rendering them moot. Seleucus himself then saw an opportunity to lure a huge portion of the phalanx away from the main Antigonid body, using light Persian cavalry to harass and feign charges against the infantry. Over time, they were isolated and then cut down or routed. 
the phalanx led by Antigonus was now slowly being pressed into a panic mode. The attendants of Antigonus cried that the troops were coming for him. But Antigonus, ever the cool general, calmly responded that of course they would come for him. Quote, what other object could they have? Demetrius will come to our rescue. End quote. Unbeknownst to Antigonus, Demetrius would never see his father alive again. A shower of javelins were launched, and the old king, riddled with wounds, collapsed to the ground, abandoned by much of his retinue. There he and the dreams of a reunited Macedonian empire would die. Antigonus was the last of his generation, of the hard-fighting men like Craterus or Permenian that had helped raise Macedon to power in both Philip and Alexander's time. It could be reasonably argued that he was the most talented of the commanders in the wake of the struggle for Alexander's empire, perhaps hoodwinked only by Seleucus Nicator. Author Richard A. Billows, in his work Antigonus the One-Eyed and the Creation of the Hellenistic State, which I have leaned heavily on, argues that much of the time Antigonus was hamstringed by the failures on part of Demetrius, from Gaza to Rhodes and most disastrously now at Ipsus. While I don't believe this entirely excuses the defeats on Antigonus's part at the hands of Eumenes or Seleucus, there is a degree of truth to this. Plutarch believed that Antigonus was riddled with pride and imperial ambition, claiming that he could have easily settled for the enormous power he had wielded and passed the torch to Demetrius peacefully. But his inner yearning for further conquest was unbounded. It cannot be said that this was a feature belonging only to Antigonus, in an age where both men and women frequently tried to play the Game of Thrones. But Antigonus' ambition probably aided in much of his success and glories. The Battle of Ipsus, as it was to be called, was effectively the end of the war. It also marked the confirmation that the Empire of Alexander would never be reunited. The victors reportedly, quote, carved up the realm which Antigonus and Demetrius had ruled, like the carcass of some great slaughtered beast, each of them taking a portion and adding new provinces to those they had already possessed, end quote. Demetrius had now barely escaped with his life, and managed to flee the battlefield with about 10,000 troops and ran with his family into hiding. Though fortune remained fickle, it would not be the last time Demetrius would have his shot at being king. But, for now, this is where we must end our narrative. Join us in the next episode, which will be the final conclusion to our five-part series on the Wars of the Diodohoi. I'm glad to be back after a month-long hiatus, so I hope this episode makes up for any of the time lost. As ever, thank you for listening to the show, and if you would like to hear more, consider subscribing to me on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. If you want to keep up with show updates, see various historical pictures and other media, or you just want to drop a line, follow me on Twitter at HellenisticPOD, that's all one word. All the sources used and a helpful guide to this episode can be found on my website, and I'll provide links for all of these in the podcast descriptions. So, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Merry Saturnalia, whatever floats your boat. And I shall look forward to speaking with you all again in 2019.